But yesterday was a good day, hopefully for most people. Did anyone get anything good for Christmas? Anything? They, yeah, some kids' hands are going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does anyone have any exchanges to make today? Did anyone get something that you opened it and said, wow, I've always wanted this? <laughs> and then the family leaves town and you go back to the store and say, hey, I got this and I didn't really want one of these. Could I exchange it? Or maybe um, your wife or not, not mine particularly, but maybe your spouse um, bought you a shirt and it's a little too tight or a little too big. And you have to go back to the store and say, hey, I need um, something instead of this. I need a different size. I got pretty good at exchanges when we did our remodel. Um, we did most of our stuff through Lowe's. And so I spent a lot of time in the line at Lowe's returning things that we didn't need and saying, could I have this instead of that? And so you go through this process of waiting in line with this thing that you bought that you thought you needed. And then you get up to the counter and they're going to they're gonna ask you, well, why do you need to return it? Is anything wrong with it? You say, no, nothing's wrong with it. And they'll take it back and then they'll let you either have a store credit or give your money back or put it back on your card so you can go back in and pick out what you really do need. We live in a world of exchanges. But there are some things you cannot exchange. There are some things you cannot give back, Right? times you buy something and it will say maybe in fine print or maybe printed big letters no returns all sales final but there are some other things that you can't exchange either let's say one of those is our circumstances because unfortunately we can't wake up in the morning and say I know this is where I am I know this is what my life looks like I know this is the circumstances surrounding everything going on in my world, but I would really like to exchange it for something better. Right? I would like to exchange my 2013 Toyota Camry for a brand new 2022, that sounds so weird, Toyota Tundra, fully loaded, but I don't want to exchange my car payment. All right. So, so there are some things you can't just exchange. You can't just get rid of. And, and so what Israel and Judah specifically is stuck with is this world that has been created by constantly having bad leaders. And if you're joining us, we're in the book of Isaiah. We're kind of finishing this up this morning at the very end of Isaiah, but really what's gotten the people of Judah to this point is a constant flow of idolatry and injustice that has really um, shaped and formed them as a people. It, it was really what defined them. And so what you have in Isaiah is these first 39 books, Isaiah 1 through 39, that really comprised the first half of the book, really almost a separate book. And it talks really about the consequences of Judah's idolatry and injustice, them having to pay the consequences for it, and over a long period of time. And what, what's frustrating about that is for some of these people, they're paying the price of the idolatry and the injustice, the sin of generations before them. They're having to pay the price of what their grandparents did. Or what their grandparents even did. And it's a really tough world when you're stuck with the consequences of someone else's decisions. You didn't get to make the bed and lie in it. Someone else made it for you. And now you're stuck with it. And then between chapter 39 and 40... There is about a 200-year gap, okay? And then you have chapters 40 through 66, which comprise basically the second half or the second book of Isaiah. And, and so there's this gap in here, and the question is, well, okay, what happens in that gap? If you'll remember back, King Hezekiah last week made this decision 
right? He made a great decision not to partner with foreign countries, and God blessed him, and he basically killed off this large number um, of, of enemies. And then, just a little bit later, he's faced with the exact same decision. But there's a new kid on the block named Babylon. And Hezekiah goes off and he makes this alliance with Babylon for protection. And Isaiah the prophet says to him, don't make this alliance. Because if you make this alliance, Babylon will turn on you and you will have to pay the consequences for this alliance. And Hezekiah doesn't listen. Hezekiah makes this alliance with Babylon and everything at the start is great. They have protection. They have safety. Everything is good. But about a hundred years after Hezekiah makes this alliance, Babylon turns on Judah. They wipe out the city of Jerusalem. And all of Judah is sent into exile. And so there's this 200-year gap, basically, between these chapters. This decision by Isaiah, or I'm sorry, the decision by Hezekiah to make an alliance and coming back from exile, which happens in chapter 40. What happens? They're in exile. They're in a foreign land. They're slaves. They're prisoners. Life is not good. Psalm 137 comes from Babylon. It says this, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps. For there our captives ask us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of Zion to the Lord while in a foreign land? They're, they're tormentors. The, the people holding them in exile are basically taunting them and saying, come on, sing us, sing us the songs about how good it is to be in Zion. Sing us to this, about how good things were there. And the people, as they sit and weep, say, when you look at our circumstances, when you look at the place we are right now, how can we be grateful and sing songs of joy of Zion? Because Zion is so far in our rearview mirror. This is the world that they live in. And then chapter 40 is this basic invitation to come back. It's an invitation to come back. But the problem is when they get back, things are not the way they expected them to be. See, and here's the thing. You can't even say things are not as they remembered because I am certain very, very, very few people were able to bridge that gap. Very few people were, were able to bridge that 90-year gap. And if they did, they most likely didn't remember what it was like in Jerusalem. They're going off of what their parents have told them about how good things were. And for them, they get back to Jerusalem. They come back from exile, and they're waiting, and they're expecting things to be a certain way, and they're not. Has there ever been a time you wanted to go back to? Like if you could just kind of stop time for a moment and go back and relive just a section of your... For me, it would be go back to college. I would go back to college, I would play baseball again, and I would have a blast, and I wouldn't worry about classes. 
If you're under 18, cover your ears for a moment. Because they didn't make a big difference in my life. No, I would love to go back and remember. But my guess is if I went back, things wouldn't be the same as I remember. They probably wouldn't be as good. They probably wouldn't be as bad. But they would not be what I would expect them to be. You see, of these people that were ripped out of a homeland for the consequences of other people's disobedience. To me, that's what makes this so difficult. They're ripped out of their homeland because of other people's disobedience, and they're forced to live with it. And they are longing for the day as exiles to get to go back. And finally, they return, and things are not as they hoped. And then Isaiah introduces what we call the suffering servant. We looked at last week. Ah. (laughs) This is the third one. If you are on video, there's a wasp that's threatening my demise. (laughs) The suffering servant. (laughs) Um, The suffering servant um, who Isaiah introduces is God's solution to the problem. You're living with the disobedience the consequences of the disobedience of previous generations. And so what are you going to do now? And God says, I'm going to send my servant. My ser- servant is going to suffer, and he's going to pay the price to give you freedom, to set captives free. And right after Isaiah 53, which is the final of the four suffering servant songs, Isaiah goes into these chapters where he basically gives you a choice. A choice of how you will respond to the servant. You can respond with humility and repentance, and he calls those people the servants, or you can reject the servant, and he labels those people the wicked. But the important part is Isaiah wants you to know you have a choice. You get to choose. You can respond in humility or you can reject the servant. But regardless, it is your choice to make. No one else, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what else is going on, it's your choice to make and no one else. It's this choice that we've been dealing with through Isaiah, through the whole thing. Old Jerusalem or New Jerusalem? Do do you want to be a part of Old Jerusalem and the way things have always been? Where where idolatry and injustice define us as a people? Or do you want to be a part of New Jerusalem? This new world of hope, of promise. But Isaiah wants you to know the choice is yours. And then he moves into these three poems. Three poems announcing good news. Good news that is coming into this world. So Isaiah 61, starting in verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news. Remember, he's talking to a people who have spent the past 90 years as exiles living in this foreign land, living as slaves, longing to go back home. And now they are back home. And so Isaiah says, here's the good news. And it's going to be proclaimed to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Next. 
the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, who is the day of vengeance for? It's for our enemies. This is the day that God is going to come and make things right. This is the day that we've longed for, when things will be as we hoped they would be. And this good news is coming to the poor, it's coming to the brokenhearted, that God is going to make things right. And the day of vengeance of our God, going on, to comfort all who mourn, next, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. They, they've, they've come back. They're back in Jerusalem. So why are they still grieving? Because their city still lays in rubble. It's going to be about another 90 years before a guy named Nehemiah comes along and says, hey, let's rebuild the wall. Before he finds the book of the law. Before he points the people back to God. There's, there's going to be about another 90 years before Nehemiah decides something needs to change. Something needs to be done. And so Isaiah, through these poems, wants to talk about some good news. Some exchanges. Some things that you can have instead of. And he uses this word instead, which is a word of exchange. I, I received this one gift, but I want something else instead. I, I got a new, um, a new Tundra, but I really wanted a new um, Camaro. Just make something up. I got this one dress, but instead I would really like to have this dress. Or I got this pair of shoes, but I'd really like to have this instead. It's a word of exchange, saying there's something different coming. And so in verse 3 of chapter 61, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. So there's the first one. The oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So there's three insteads. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Why the insteads? Why are they so important? Right? Ashes are a sign of mourning. And in a city that lays in rubble, there are plenty of ashes. And during this time, when people mourned, they would cover themselves, their face, with ashes. It was this almost outward sign of the inner ruin and rubble that they were experiencing in their life. A ashes provided that visibility of what was going on inside. But this beauty, this crown of beauty, was given for jubilant victory. It was the person who stood atop the winner's podium. It was this garland wreath is really kind of what it's talking about. It was placed on the head of the winner when everything in their world was right. That, that you could stand victorious in this new world. The oil of joy instead of mourning. Because if there's anything that mourning causes, it's tears. And a constant flow of tears will dry out our face. But oil will restore the skin. It will bring moisture to it. It will give it a glow. And then a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. A spirit of despair is a weak and lifeless life. It is void of hope. It's, I have no desire to get out, no desire to go anywhere. This is just how things are going to be. This is how they are now, and there's really not any hope of them changing. That, that's what we mean by a spirit of despair. Like there's nowhere to go, there's no one to see. I might as well just stay 
inside. But a garment of praise, a, a garment is something you put on to go out. It clothes you. It makes you feel safe. It makes you feel comfortable. A garment is something that you wear. And what Isaiah would want you to know is exchange is possible. You are not stuck with the mourning. You are not stuck with the ashes. You are not stuck in despair. You can have something else instead. You can have something better. You don't have to stay where you are right now. There is a better alternative. But as we said, the choice is yours. It is a choice you have to make. And that is the good news on the other side of Christmas. The good news is Christ, through his presence, has come into the world. But the problem is we are still waiting for everything to be made right. For these people who find themselves as exiles, they were waiting for Jerusalem to be restored. They were waiting for things to look as they should. And you and I are waiting. The promised king has come into the world. And he has won a victory over sin and death. But yet when you look around at the world, there is a sense that things are not as they should. We are waiting. We are waiting for things to be restored. We are waiting for all things to be made new. We are waiting for the hope that Christ would be on the King and that every knee on heaven and earth would bow and confess that He is Lord. We are waiting for that day. But I think Isaiah would tell you the same thing he tells the people of Judah that in your waiting, you still have a choice of how you will wait. You still get to choose New Jerusalem instead of Old Jerusalem. The servants instead of the wicked. Wisdom instead of folly, life instead of death, beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of cheer. You get to decide. Right now we're at a time of year. This is the last Sunday of 2021. And so many people over the next week are probably going to be thinking about resolutions that you can make and how this next year is going to be different. Isaiah says you get to choose. You get to choose. Will this be a, a year that is full of despair, of ashes, of mourning? Or will it be a year of joy? A year where the oil refreshes your body? Will it be a year where you are living your life for Jesus? You get to choose. These last two years have been really difficult years. Not to say that years in the past and things other generations have gone through are not much easier. But for all of us, these years have been hard. Our world 
has changed dramatically. The world that we know. Our rhythms have been interrupted. We've said goodbye to people that we love and care about. Some far too early because of a disease. Because of a virus. We've been stuck inside at different times. We had Antarctica move into Texas. Um, it's been a long year. And you turn on the news, and there's still more talk of COVID and what could happen, of turmoil in other countries turmoil within our own country. And you think, well, I don't know that 2022 looks like things are going to change. But it can. See, see here's what Isaiah wants you to know. This is, this is important. Listen. That in spite of your circumstances, that in spite of what's going on in your world, that you can still experience the joy and the freedom that Jesus will bring you. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of what's going on in your world, you can still experience the joy that Jesus will bring you. But here's the thing. It's still your choice. No one else can make that decision except for you. You get to choose. And the beauty of it is you don't have to wait till Saturday in January 1st. You can make that choice right now. That today, joy is going to fill my heart. Today, I'm going to live with hope. Today, I'm going to allow God to minister to my broken spirit and to bring healing to my life. Regardless of what's going on, the choice is yours. Choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. Father, as we um, come to another end of a long year, Father, we have hope. We have hope that the way things are now is not the way they will always be. Because we believe you conquered the grave. And the power of the curse of sin has lost all strength. But yet at the same time, Father, we wait. We wait on Jesus' kingdom to be fully and finally realized. For things to be as they are supposed to be. A world where there is no sorrow, no more heartache, no more pain. Where you have cared for the poor and the brokenhearted. Where you have released the prisoners. We wait. But again, Father, we wait with a choice. And Father, today, again, our choice is to choose Jesus. To believe that his world is a better world than anything we could possibly dream up or create here on our own. And so, Father, we need you. We need you to give strength 
We need you to open our eyes and help us to see a world that's not yet here now. Father, to live our lives as if it is. Thank you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his gift. Thank you for life. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.